Right. All right. So I'll just hit never mind. All right. So did we do all but two problems for the green chicken? We didn't get to. We didn't do the latter problem. <coughs> and then we didn't do part B of five? Yeah. Okay. So, and then you'll have to just warn me if I get outside the range. So 2014, number 5B. So this is the question of exactly how much detail do you want to get into. We want to have the minimum number of distinct parts. Of four elements. From uh, 2014 integers greater than or equal to 36. The first part of the problem was to find the maximum number. And to find the maximum number, we said, well, if we take all distinct primes, then every product is going to be distinct by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So, what we want now is we want as many collisions as possible. So the question is exactly, you know, how much detail do you need to get into something like this? We were somewhat generous. So as an idea, p, p squared, p cubed, p to the 2014. So this is definitely a strong candidate to look at. We want to have as many things aligning as possible. And when we look at this, it seems to make sense to have all of the numbers being the same prime, you know, just to different powers. If they had different powers, then that's going to minimize the chance of having overlaps. So I think with a little bit of a you know, thought, you can reduce to the case where you have one prime to 2,014 different powers. And then the question becomes, how should you choose those numbers to minimize the number of possible sums of four elements? So what we really have is we have some set A is a 1, a 2, a 2014. It's contained in the natural numbers. And we want to minimize the cardinality of the set of A plus A plus A plus A. And so I've led a lot of small projects over the years with students who looked at problems like this, where if you have a sum set, if you have a different set, what can you say about the size and the cardinalities of these objects? In terms of connecting to mathematics, this is extremely important. So this is the little questions with the lowercase l. You know, think of like Fermat's little theorem. As soon as you think of Fermat's little theorem, what's the corresponding one you think of? Fermat's last theorem. Fermat's last theorem. And so Fermat's last theorem says that if you want to solve x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n in integers with n greater than 3, the only way you can do that is trivial, where one of the x's, y's, or z's has to be 0. Well, if x equals 0, you get y then equals z to the n. That's not that hard to solve in the integers. You can recast this in terms of questions about adding the set to itself. Look at the set of nth powers. Add to the set of nth powers the set of nth powers. And what you're asking is, if um, this is the set of nth powers, and you add to it the set of nth powers, and you take the intersection of that with the set of nth powers, this is the empty set if n is greater than or equal to 3. And so here, my nth power is going to be positive nth powers. That's from our last theorem. This is not the way to approach it, but this is a way to put the Mars last name in context, is we have a set, and we're trying to talk about what kind of elements can we have in the sum set. And here, it's the most basic question you can ask. Is there anything there? And the Mars last name is the answer is no. All right, so getting back to this question, if all of the numbers are just primes to different powers, and they have to be integers, then the question becomes, What's the best integer set to take? And then this really becomes, you know, how much detail do you want to get into? Without loss of generality, what can you say about A1? Smallest. Smallest. And you will put the numbers in increasing order. So we've seen this theme numerous times throughout the semester. Have them in increasing order. So we can order. 
A1 strictly less than A2 less than less than A2014. What other simplifications can we make? Any other simplifications we can make? Well, the size of your sum set um, shouldn't you could you could reduce everything by a constant. So you could say A1 Good. is like one. Right. We can't make A1 zero because we've said all the numbers are at least 36. So as long as our prime is big, you know, prime is at least 37, we can, if we want, assume that A1 equals 1. Or if we consider this related question, we could, if we want, choose A1 to be 0. doesn't really matter. Question? Yeah, I guess I'm a little uncomfortable just making it 1 because we're dealing with products. And products of AIs, maybe I've lost. Okay, well, so now let's imagine we have you know, P, P squared, P to the fourth, and P to the eighth. And let's add three to everything. So we would have P to the fourth, P to the fifth, P to the seventh, and P to the eleventh. Oh, okay, so we're working under the assumption that we're trying to construct P, P squared, P cubed. Right. Okay. And so now in this case, if we look on this side, we're going to get uh, 8, 12, 13, 14, 15. And on this case, we'll get 18, uh, 23, 28, uh, 27. And if you look at this, what's the difference between these two numbers? The difference is it's p to the 12. And p to the 12 is p cubed times p cubed times p cubed times p cubed. So what we're doing is, if we subtract or add a fixed number to all of them, then we're going to change all of the products by just the same number. We're going to rescale all the products here by p to the 12. So if you want, we might as well standardize things so that the first number is 1. And so we can make this assumption that the first number is 1, and now continue our analysis. And then the question becomes, what is the way to choose these numbers so that we have the maximum possible repeats? Was there a suggestion for us as to what to do? Or So the smallest thing we can do is you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 2014. And we can see how many that would give. So we could look at 1, 2, 3, 4, 2014. Since we have to choose four elements, the smallest thing we could get would be 10. And now we could also, we could get 11 by replacing the 4 with the 5. We could get 12. We could get all the way up to going to 2014, 2013, 2012, 2011. So it should be 8,000, um, 14, 13, 12, 11. So this should be 10, right? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So if I've done the calculation correctly, I think we can get all the way up to 8,050. The question is, can we do better? And then, this is a great opportunity. You know, some of you have wanted an opportunity to write things up more rigorously. I'll do just a little bit more here and then leave this as an exercise if you want to write it up and show me. Can you prove rigorously you can't do better than this? One idea might be if we had a situation where we had a gap, Show us that if, show that if we somehow remove the gap, we decrease the number of sums we have. Or at worst, leave the number of sums unchanged. Think of this almost in terms of the modern invariance. Think of this almost in terms of we had the number 100, we're trying to break it into sums so that their product was as large as possible. And we show that if we had two numbers that weren't equal, you know, when we're trying to maximize the product, we've broken this up into having two summons, three summons, four summons, five summons. If we have exactly five summons, the maximum product is when they're all equal. And one way to see this is if two of them are unequal, if we replaced it with the average value, that then made the product larger. And so we just keep flowing like this. If we ever had a situation where two things weren't equal, we would keep flowing. And eventually, we get to the point where everything is equal. Because we have a compact set, we know a maximum is going to be attained. 
can you do something like that rigorously over here and say, look, we have, we have these integers here. If ever there were a gap, then this you know, can only increase the number of distinct possible sums. We want to maximize alignments. Okay, so I'll leave this as you know, an exercise for those of you who wanted to think about some of the problems and didn't want to see all the solutions to think about this and you know, see if you can be clear here. There's also a pretty straightforward way to do it by injection. Oh, okay, right. okay. That's all. I want to be really Okay. Okay. All right. And then the last one, I think, was the ladder problem. No, it's the flipping a coin problem. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Do we do the ladder problem? The ladder problem is number four. Okay, so we, we have the ladder and the coin. Okay. <coughs> okay, so this one is flip. We have coin independently, so k tosses ahead, move k steps right, else k left. And the question is, what is the probability we turn to stop after n tosses? I'm sorry, after 2014 tosses. So one thing is to try to break this up into smaller cases, build intuition. If you toss the coin once, what's the probability? Zero. 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 You're always at plus or minus one. All right? If n equals two, what's the probability? Zero. Zero. So if you think about where we are, we're going to be, we're at plus or minus one, and now we move plus or minus two. So the possibilities are now plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3. Now things get interesting. When n equals 3, is there a chance of getting home? Yes. Yes. If we were at the plus or minus 3, we could be home. If not, all right, so we're going to leave the probability as something to be determined, because we don't care about it for this problem. Mm -hmm. There is a chance. We could be at plus or minus 6. We could be at 0. We could be plus or minus 4. Anything else we could be at? Plus or minus, plus minus, plus minus 2. And I won't even bother writing plus or minus 0. So there is a chance of being home after uh, 3 tosses. We can continue, and now we go to n equals 4. Is there a chance of being home after 4 tosses? Yes. Yes, unfortunately, because from the 4. So now, you could be plus or minus 10 from the 6, right? Mm -hmm. Could we be 8? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Could we be 6? Yes. Yes. Could we be 4? Yes. Yes. Could we be 2? Yeah, yes. Yeah, we could have a negative 2 and get a positive 4, vice versa. All right, let's do one more. Let's do n equals 5. I have no idea if this is going to be in the camera range, is it? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Excellent. So what's the probability that we're home after 5 tosses? Zero. Zero. Because now we're adding an odd number. And so now, all is odd. Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference between contest problems and real life. Every contest problem, if it's a good one, has to have a somewhat simple solution that has to be the aha moment. The Putnam is great at that. Where if you look at the problem just the right way, and it often takes you know four shots or whatever to look at it the right way, it's now, oh, that's all we have to do. Okay, I think I've told you about the Russian problems or the killer problems or the Jewish problems where they're designed to prevent certain people from getting PhDs. So that the exam is because it's not that hard of a problem, it's just you, if you know the backdoor trick, and then you build the problem around it, and then you remove all the scaffolding, you know, it looks like it's very hard. But if you look at it the right way, it's very simple. So in some sense, when you're looking at a lot of these problems, if the calculation is becoming too tedious, you're doing something wrong. So in terms of what's going on, there's got to be either a really simple formula for figuring out what's going on, or the probability has to be a really nice number. What are the really nice probabilities? Yeah. Zero. Zero. Anything else? One. 
one, what 50. else? 50. You know, 50, 50 could be you know, a nice probability. One over two to the end, which I think is like what you'll end up with, uh, with like the three and four case, is something of, of something like that. Some potential something like that. Maybe something involving one over 2014, because this is, I'm saying these are the candidates. I see several of you shaking your heads. Yes, these candidates fail miserably. All right. These are the third party candidates that don't get many votes. All right. But they're at least potentially possible. Okay. <coughs> this problem, really, my gut instinct is it's got to be zero or the calculation is going to be so involved. All right. And again, for over here, you can figure out how many paths there are. What's going on here is you notice there's a parity issue. That for certain ones, all the numbers are odd. For certain ones, all the numbers are even. Is it possible to have both evens and odds? No. Why not? Because basically, what haven't we done yet today? Induction. induction. Right? You, know, you should always do induction every day. And I'll leave it for this. So over here, the first case, you know, it's all odds. Let's assume up to a certain point, everything is either always even or always odd. Well, on the next turn, we're adding either an even number to everything or an odd number to everything. And we either keep the parity or we flip the parity. So what we know is in every line, everything is either even or everything is odd. If you had your choice, which line would you love to look at for a problem like this? First line. The first line, or what else? Anything that's odd. So any line when everything is odd, the probability will be very easy to calculate. So gut feeling, 2014 should correspond to a line that's odd. And so the question is, what is the probability of 2014 that saves the day? Or when you get yeah, this? It is 2 more 4. And so I was trying to have fun with the green chicken here and put the number in every problem in if possible, non-trivial ways. So the horse racing problem was non-trivial, and it was very close to the fact that you know, 2014 is not that far away, I think 2520. The last one we just did with the minimum number of distinct products, 2014 doesn't really matter. There's no real properties of 2014 that have anything to do with that problem. That's one where the year is a complete red herring, doesn't really matter. Here, 2014 matters just a little bit. We needed 2014 to be 2 mod 3. Why? If you look at where you are, for epsilon 1 plus 1, epsilon 2, 2, plus epsilon 2014 times 2014. So on each turn, we either get a head or a tail. Epsilon 1 will be 1 if the first toss is a head. It will be minus 1 if it's a tail. This will tell us how much we've moved to the left or the right. What's the easiest sequence to understand? All heads. Second easiest. All, all tails. tails. Right. We seem to have a preference as liking heads, moving all the way to the right. If everything was a head, if epsilon i always equals 1, we get 1 plus 2 plus 2014. That's 2014 times 2015. You're off the thing. I'm sorry? Yeah. I'm off the thing. Thank you. Now we can move it out a little bit. So it's supposed to be swiveling, but it's That's not swiveling. Better. Okay. So if we add all the way up, we get 2014, 2015 over 2. 2 goes into 2014, 1007 times 2015, and this is odd. So if they're all heads, we've moved in odd numbers. <coughs> if we had one of these become a tail, we've changed by twice this quantity. Doesn't matter if this is 2, 3, 4, 5, we've changed by twice. So we've gone, say, from plus 5 to minus 5. That's a change of 2 times 5. We've gone from plus 8 to minus 8. It's a change of 2 times 8. Plus 17 to minus 17. A change of 2 times 17. So to switch anything to a minus sign does not change the parity of the sum. And so if you want, think of this almost as a mono-invariant problem. And this is extreme overkill. But you know, think of it as I have a quantity like this, you give me your string of heads and tails, and I change my epsilons one at a time. 
And every time I do that, I change by an even number, I'm still going to be an odd number at the end of the day. If you wanted to do the change all in one line, by all means do that and just say, look, it's two times that sum. And so you always have an odd number, therefore you have no chance of being Okay. Any other questions on this one? Okay, so the last one was the latter one. Okay. I can't remember what it was that Kim and Kayla were doing, but something they were doing was making me think of ladders and climbing. So this was number four. So we're looking at ladder. So we say there is, I think, a K ladder number. Or is it K ladder four? Ladder four. K ladder four. If there are K, do they have to be adjacent or no? You're yeah, taking consecutive times. P1, P2, PK, such that P1 to the 1, P2 to the 2, PK to the K divides N, that PI, PI plus 1 is not divided. Okay. And then the question is, uh, are there a positive percent of k radical numbers? Are there a positive percent of 2014 radical numbers? So what a positive percent means is if I count all the way up to x, there's going to be a fixed fraction such that I'll always get at least that fraction of numbers. Maybe I'll get at least one-tenth of the numbers, at least one thousand, at least one billion. It could be small. There is, um, as an aside, uh, you know, we're getting close to the time where some of you might be considering applying to small, so I'm happy to use some of these opportunities to talk about some of the projects my students and I have looked at over the years. One of the things we had talked about earlier today was adding sets to themselves, looking at possible sums and differences. One of the interesting questions my colleagues and I have looked at is if you take two finite sets, which do you think should have more elements, a plus a or a minus a? Set of possible sums or set of possible differences? I'm sorry? Yeah, no. Differences. Okay, why differences? Because you can always switch and so... So 3 plus 4 is the same as 4 plus 3. Each pair is only going to give you one sum, but it will give you two differences. So that's a huge vote for A minus A. The only vote in favor of A plus A is that if you ever take the same number twice, you always get zero here, but you get distinct things here. Well, if, I, if my set has you know, n elements, I only take the same number both times n times, whereas I take two different numbers on the order of n squared times. So I'm going to have far more pairs of distinct elements than common elements. So I would expect the different set to be larger. And what people notice is, while there were sets that had more sums than differences, they were very rare. And it was conjectured that in the limit, as A gets larger and larger and larger, if you choose each element to be in your set A with, say, probability 1 half, then in the limit, every set with probability 1 will have more differences than sums. It turns out this conjecture is wrong. A positive percent of the time, you have more sums than differences. We have now narrowed down the constant to be approximately 10 to the negative 4. It's small. Ha 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 ha. I'm sorry? So you, you did this at small. No, we, we, we didn't. Other people proved the constant. Uh, not us. <laughs> so, small is working on another constant. And so it's too much of an insight to go into the constant that small is working on. <laughs> but the fact is, the numerics were very misleading. And there's a lot that you know, can be said about this, but it is a positive percent of the time. It's very, very rare, but it still happens a huge amount of the time. So one of the big things that goes on in mathematics is counting how often something happens. What fraction of the time? If I want to look at all numbers up to a thousand, a million, a billion, a trillion, a quadrillion, how often is some behavior going to happen? So over here, we want to show that a positive percent of the time, there are 2014 radical numbers. How might you attack this? What might you look at first? One ladder pulse. One ladder pulse. 
So our one ladder from number just means that there's a prime that divides the, the number to the first power. There could be other things. So I can write my number n as p times m, where p does not divide m. So I need to think of lots and lots and lots of ways of choosing numbers m that are not divisible by p. I want to somehow parameterize this. I want to somehow list a lot of them. Can anybody think of ways to list a bunch of m's? So one thing is I could have that m be another prime, but then the difficulty with that, so if I take m to be q to the l, I can now vary my prime q and I can vary my power l, and I want to know how many of those will I get. And so those are going to be, it's a little bit more work to do that. I want to have a richer set, a larger set. So the first is, let's go back a little bit. Can somebody give me a set that has a positive percent in the limit? I want to set so that maybe half of the numbers, odds, the odds. So the odds are of the form 2m plus 1. So if I want to count how many odds are there up to x, there's about x over 2 odds. Can somebody give me another set that has density 1 half? Evens. How about something that happens just 25% of the time? Multiples of four. So say density one four. I could do four m. I could do four m plus one, four m plus two, four m plus three. Each of these sequences in the limit will occur twenty five percent of the time. So now, if I go back to the original problem, I want to choose my m so that it doesn't have a common factor with p, and I want to get a large number of things. So what would be a good choice for M? What should we try? M P plus one. I'm sorry? M P plus one. So I could try M is equal to K P plus one. And if I do it like this, this is going to force M to be relatively prime from P. So I'm not going to have P squared divide my number. So now I get M is P times K P plus one. If you multiply it out, it's kp squared plus p. And you can see clearly p is going to divide this, but p squared won't. <coughs> and what fraction of the time is this going to be? Basically 1 over p squared. You know, every p squared numbers or so, I get another element. So a huge percent of the time, I will be getting a one radical number. And this is actually a one radical number for a very specific choice of p. I have the ability to vary p as well. And so if I allow myself to vary p as well, things are much better. And then it becomes an interesting question, how many numbers are you know, one radical? What is that positive percentage? This is just a lower bound. This is looking at a very special case. OK, now that we build, up, now let's build on our success with just one radical. Let's try two latiform numbers. So for a two latiform number, what we would want to do is we want n to be p1, p2 squared times m, where p1 does not divide m and p2 does not divide m. Well, we just have to modify what we did a moment ago. Yeah, before, we just said, look, we had this number, it was p. So we looked at all numbers in the form k times p plus 1. So now we can take m to be of the form p1, p2 squared k plus 1. And that would give us our numbers p1, p2 squared k, p1, p2 squared plus 1, or p1, p2 squared squared k plus p1, p2 squared. And so by doing small cases like this, if we wanted to now do 3 radical, well, all we do is we add a p3 cubed. And the argument follows. So one of the best pieces of advice I can do whenever you have a problem like this, and they will do this to you frequently on the Putnam, 
check smaller cases. Check smaller cases carefully. Build intuition. Frequently, the smaller cases have the same ideas as the general case, but it's a lot less overwhelming. And if you look at the smaller cases and try to get a sense of what's going on, you can then hopefully pass from that to the more general situation. Okay. Any other questions about the green chicken example from 2014? Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to use the rest of the time to talk a little bit about uh, programming you know, for Project Royal. And again, um, I want you to just have some useful skills as math majors. Let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, not even...